So let's actually talk about getting into some sources. I mean, I hope that you will develop a research method that is more complex than going to the library and grabbing books with titles. I mean, I know I've done that before, so uh, I can't say too much. Uh, but if you want to be a good researcher, if you want to actually teach people to be good researchers, you've got to learn how not just to find sources, you have to find the best sources. You have to find sources that are better than everyone else's, and you have to know where to look for it. Because the problem that you're going to run into is very different from what probably your parents, uh, I guess your parents, and your grandparents did. Your grandparents, before the internet, if they came through the university or school or whatever, their problem probably was, how do I find enough sources to write this paper? So you've got to find five to ten sources, let's say, for this research paper, and the only place you can do it, if you're your grandparents, is the library. And the library is a wonderful place, don't get me wrong, but the library cannot possibly have 10 to 20 sources on every possible topic that somebody might want. Uh, they, may have, they may have millions of books, and I promise you there will be topics that you'll think of that they just won't have the, uh, the resources for. And that's why libraries today are very different, because they've changed with the times. The internet has made the old idea of a library as the place where we keep books. <clears throat> and so if you want a book, you go to the library because that's where they have them. <clears throat> yes, they still do that, but that is not a library's primary purpose anymore. And why not? Because the internet has all of that for you. If you spend five minutes on the internet, and we'll talk about some of the places you can go look, you can probably find more books and more sources than your parents and grandparents could have found in a, you can find them in more in like five minutes than your parents or grandparents could have found in like two weeks. So your problem is going to be the exact opposite. It's not going to be, how do I find enough sources? It's going to be, I've got 10,000 hits and 30,000 books. How do I choose which books to use and which ones not to use? And how do I do it in any kind of a timely manner? Because there's no way, if you get, uh, you do a Google search and you get 3 million returns, there's no way that you're going to be able to go through all of those to find out what's best. I mean, what happens if it turns out that one of the best sources you could be, that you need for your paper is on search result page 10,789. Are you, you're not gonna read that far, that's ridiculous. So you gotta find a way to get what you want out of that big mess and have it come back easy and in a short amount of time. I keep saying this and I'll, I'll continue to say this, my goal, my approach when I try to teach you this stuff is not because I want it to dominate your life. I want you to do, I want you to have your cake and eat it too. Have y'all heard that idiom before? Have your cake and eat it too? It means you get everything. So I want you to be able to get five plus 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 on all your papers for all your research. And I want you to be able to do it without spending 40 hours a week in the library just researching. I'd like you to be able to do it in a, in a, I'd like you to be able to go and get your research done in 20, if you could do it in 20 minutes, that'd be great. But you know, if you could do it in 20, assemble all of your sources in 20 minutes and they're good sources, they're the right sources, great. Why spend five hours doing the same thing that you can do in 20 minutes if you're getting the same result and it's still that good? <clears throat> so anyway, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking today at the different types of sources and where you can find them. One of the very first things that you have to understand is that not all sources are equal. That's why the grabbing books off the shelf thing does not work, at least not if you actually care about what you're trying to do. Because the, this book here may be wonderful, the book sitting next to it with a very similar title may suck mud up a straw. It may be absolutely worthless. Uh, and actually there's some books that if you're not paying attention, they can get you in trouble. I mentioned to another class, um, you've probably never heard of this, but I came across a journal article or a journal once 
called the uh, Journal for Historical Review. Sounds nice and academic, right? And if you were going along, hey, here's the Journal for Historical Review. I'll use that in my paper. It's, a, it's about German history. And the, and the group that puts it out is called the Institute for Historical Review. You, wanna, you know who, who the Institute for Historical Review are? Holocaust deniers. Yes. And this journal that they put out looks really good on the surface. It, it's, it's printed professionally and it, it, it looks like it's all this scholarly in-depth research. If you don't know what you're doing, you can end up quoting from, a, from the Journal for Historical Review. And if you're writing for a German history professor, they're liable to look at it and go, what? You just gave me a Holocaust denier article in your paper? Uh, yeah, that, I'm sure that would do lots of good for your standing at the university. So what, you have to know what the different kinds of sources are. You have to know how to get to them easier. And that's what I want to try to do is kind of give, give, you, give you a start on that, give you some, give you some basics. And, and by the way, there is a uh, modern allegory to grabbing books off the shelf. That, that's what your parents and grandparents did. Maybe you've done it too. But the modern analogy or allegory to uh, grabbing books off the shelf is Google searching and taking the things off the first page. Does anybody remember, I think we've said this before, do you know how the search results that end up on the first page of, of Google get there? They're paid, yes. So the only reason they're there is because somebody paid money for you to see their result first in line uh, when you, and, and they're, they're ads and they're also the results. The search results do it too. So what we need to try to do is figure out better ways to do it. How do you get to the good sources? What kinds of sources are you looking for? Are there ways you can get through the sources quickly? That's, that's, that's what all we're trying to do. So first, what makes good research? The point of research is to, well, identify truth. Uh, and your research should identify, therefore, reliable facts and evidence. And if that sounds really basic, just hang around academia for a while and you'll see why it's worth mentioning. Because increasingly, especially uh, since the 1960s and 70s, research for some people has been about proving agendas. It's not about actually finding out what's real, what's right, and what's true. It's about taking my particular social or political agenda and pushing it down people's throats as hard and as fast as I possibly can using whatever evidence I can find. And that is not what I think you should be doing. Uh, if, if, you're going to, if, I, if I'm going to send you out and say, I tried to train you in research, I'm going to say it's your job to find out the truth whether you like it or not. Go out there, figure out what it actually is. And so if you're going to do that, you have to be able to find, you can't just find any source. You have to find the best sources. You also have to find sources that disagree with each other. Why, why disagree with each other? Because you need to make sure you're looking at everyone's point of view. You need to actually understand the different perspectives that there are on the topic. Not just the ones you agree with, not just the ones that you like, uh, that's, that, that's what the uh, agenda-driven approach does. They go out and find only things that they like and they deal with those. You need to go find people who disagree with you too <clears throat> and take a look at that. So a research paper in the end is only as good as the evidence that you have supporting it. That's what a research paper does is it presents research. So if your research stinks, then your paper is going to stink. And if your uh, professor or whoever is reading it, the editor uh, of the journal, uh, knows anything about what they're talking about, then they, may, they will tear it apart if you have bad sources. Because there's, you know, it doesn't matter. You, you can have those beautiful pros in the world, but if what you're writing about is baloney or even an outright lie, then it's worthless. So you have to play it premium on learning how to properly handle evidence and you should also want to place a premium on finding it as easily as possible. Now, why do I say that? Just because of life. I mean, I'm sure this is the only class you have, right? You, you spend your whole day, you spend your whole week 
just you know, watching movies uh, with your feet up on the, on, on the couch, and you only come to this class. Yeah, uh-huh, right, sure. Uh, so of course my point is that you want to try to make all of, the, all of your processes as easy as possible for you. There's nothing, some people, I was talking to somebody in the writing center yesterday and she was having a real hard time with her thesis statement. And what it boiled down to was she, th she thought her thesis statement wasn't confusing enough. She thought it, in order to be academic, it had to be really complex and convoluted and make no sense whatsoever. And I was like, no, do what works. Research is the same thing. To be good research, to do good research, you don't have to spend 30 hours in the library. Good research is good research if you don't do it right. So make it as easy as you can. So kinds of evidence. These are the different things that you'll be, lo that you'll be looking for and dealing with. And I, I am a historian. That is my training. So I'm kind of, this is kind of a vaguely historical point of view, but it's applicable to just about anything. You can take this approach to literature, to science, to whatever you're writing about. So broadly speaking, there are two different types of evidence that you're going to be dealing with uh, as you're researching. The first is called primary sources. Primary sources come directly from a witness or a participant to what you're dealing with. So let's say that you are writing your research paper about motorsports. A primary source would be, a, would be a, an article from a rider in motocross telling you what it's like to be on the bike. Or it would be a video, uh, uh, a GoPro video of someone actually riding on, on the course. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, history, if you were writing a, uh, a paper about the riots in Poznan, uh, in the 1950s, a primary source would be someone who was there, someone who saw it happen and someone who was directly involved. And so they can tell you all of these things. Now, primary sources are wonderful things and they should be at, at this level. You're not going to use quite so many of them because what you're, what you're giving is the, the papers that you're writing are, are what are properly called synthesis papers. You're going out and you're reading a bunch of different people's perspectives and you're giving a summary of what they think. But as you move farther on uh, to your three, your three BA thesis and beyond, you're going to want to rely more and more on these primary sources because you want to say something new. You want to say something important. And so it's not just enough to go back and tell everybody, well, this is what they've been saying for the last 50 years about this topic. Again, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to find out something unique. And so to do that, you have to go back and you have to hear straight from the horse's mouth to use another idiom. Uh, you have to hear directly from the participants and it just makes sense. I mean, if you're writing a paper and you decide to do a biography of someone, what is going to be more convincing to hear, uh, to read a scholar say, this person thought that politics were a waste of time. Okay, that's fine. But is that as impressive as quoting from the person himself and saying, I think that politics were a waste of time, said Joe Blow. Obviously, when you can hear straight from the person, it's going to be more powerful and it's going to be more convincing. It's the same thing about the, uh, the, the riots. Somebody says the riots raged all over Poznan uh, and included uh, police beatings in the streets. That's good. I'm not trying to knock that, but is that as, is that as convincing to you as quoting from someone who says, I was in the streets and I faced the police and they were attacking us. Obviously that is not, you know, that, that's going to be much more convincing. So primary sources are really, really good stuff. Uh, this is like, if you're doing science, this is like quoting directly from an experiment. If you're doing literature, this is quoting straight from the sources. So an example of a, prim uh, a primary source for that Witcher paper. What would, you, what would a primary source for that Witcher paper be? Witcher the Witcher books or the legends themselves, as opposed to what a scholar said about those things. So yeah, uh, you want to have those. 
uh, the only the problem with primary sources a lot of the time is that primary sources are very narrow. Primary sources are one person's perspective, one person's opinion of what's happening. And if you're going to do good research, you don't want just one person's perspective. You want to see what everything is going on. So, uh, and sometimes you can run into real problems with that. And to give you an, an example that I saw when I was uh, working on one of my books, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg in the United States was a pretty big battle. There were uh, over over a hundred thousand people, almost two hundred thousand people involved, and so there are primary sources from all over. And in, in day three of the Battle of Gettysburg, there was this huge attack by the Confederates called Pickett's Charge, and it's one of the one of the most studied moments in American history. Well, <clears throat> when I was doing research for one of my uh, uh, for one of my books. I came across plenty of source of primary sources of people on the third day of Gettysburg saying, oh, well, today was pretty quiet. Uh, we, we sat here, we heard some fighting. It sounded like there was something going on over there beyond that hill, but uh, we heard there was, some, there was a big fight, but it you know, didn't, didn't bother us uh, because they weren't in the right spot in the line. Uh, this was, you know, there's a hundred thousand men in the army and these guys were all the way back over here when the fighting was over here. So if you just stop with that one primary source, you get the idea that, Hey, day three at Gettysburg, not a big deal. When in truth there, you know, there were tens of thousands of people being shot down and killed just over the hill. So that's why when you deal with primary sources, and this is, you know, again, looking forward to three BA and beyond you're going to want to get as many primary sources as you possibly can. Don't just stop with one or two or three. If you're going to, if you're going to really do this right, like if you start looking for thesis level, you, you, might, you might have to do dozens. Uh, if you're going to write a good history book, uh, you might have to look at hundreds or even thousands. Uh, and from that, you, you draw in all of this information. Now, obviously, you're not looking at thousands for a research paper in 2BA. Uh, but at the same time, when you're thinking about it, you're looking at your sources, I'd consider it. If you're doing something that, uh, that, that, uh, that lends itself to firsthand accounts, are you going to be more convincing by just summarizing what some scholar said? Or can you give us a direct quote from somebody who saw this happen? That's going to be more potent. More, it's also just more interesting when you're trying to read it. Secondary sources are the opposite of primary sources, I guess you'd say. They are from people who did not see what happened. And what they're doing is they're writing about what happened based on their research into primary sources. So a good example of a secondary, uh, of a secondary source would be like a historian, uh, or as I said, a scholar, a scientist, or a reporter. Most reporters do not see the, the actual thing that happens. They go and talk to the people who did see what happened, and then they write you a story and say, this is what happened. Now, obviously, I, I think the shortcoming of secondary sources should be clear. Secondary sources did not see this happen. And therefore, they don't have that firsthand view. And so you might be thinking, so why in the world do we bother? Well, because secondary sources have a really big advantage. They boil a lot of information down and they give it to you in an hourglass. If you read a good book, and most of the, you're probably not gonna read, you're probably not gonna read too many book books uh, for this particular assignment, but you're going into 3BA and you, you're gonna write that that history paper or somehow, and you need to know what happened. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll say here, we'll, we'll, we'll say here if uh, the riots in Poznan, you need to know what happened. Well, you can go out and you can interview hundreds of people. You can go to archives and you can dig up letters and you can spend hours and hours in the libraries looking at, uh, look at looking at old newspapers and reading all of these things. And by the time you're done with all of that, maybe two or three years has passed and you can write a book. Or you can let somebody else do that for you. They can write the book and you can read it in a couple of hours. 
Yeah, hopefully you see what I'm getting at here. When you read someone's article or book uh, or journal or whatever, you are actually getting the results of sometimes literally hundreds of years of research in the matter in a matter of minutes. Why do I say hundreds of years? Because there, some, some books that you're going to be dealing with, people will have spent 20 or 30 years of their lives on. And so you go out and you research 10, 20 of those books for some big project, you are probably literally getting the sum total of 100 or more years of research, and you're able to read it in hours, days, weeks. I mean, it's pretty incredible when you actually stop and think about it. It's... Well, reading in general, when you get down to it, is uh, pretty crazy because you go and you pick up something like Machiavelli's The Prince, and you're essentially having a conversation with a guy who's been dead for three or four hundred years, and you're getting his perspective on everything. And when you write something and it, and it gets left behind and somebody comes back a hundred years from now, you're affecting them just like you were affected by the people that you've been reading and studying. So anyway, hopefully what you, what, what you see is that most research projects use a good balance of both of these. There's just no way that you're going to be able for this project or your 3BA thesis to go out and do only primary research. You just don't have the time. So what do you do? You read secondary sources or view them. You, you, come, you, you get lots of other people's research into your head very quickly. And then you go out and you research primary sources separately and you put both in your paper. And so <clears throat> anyway, that's one of the things I'm going to suggest first that you look for a balance of both kinds and know what you're looking for. If you know I want to find a primary source about this particular topic, you'll have a much better idea of where to look for it to begin with. And that means you don't have to spend all this extra time just fiddling around guessing. That's, that's the big problem, one of the big problems with the whole grab the books off the shelf thing. What happens if you grab 20 books and it turns out only two of them are worthwhile? You gotta go back again, and then you gotta go back again, and then you gotta go back again. If you think about it ahead of time and you target what you're, aim, what you're, trying, to, what you're trying to find, you can get it all done in maybe one trip or two at the most. Sometimes you don't even have to go anywhere. Uh, I wrote my entire dissertation on a guy from New York without ever having to visit New York. Why? Because of this wonderful thing because of the, the, uh, called the internet. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a, in a while. Another important distinction that you're going to be wanting to pay attention to is popular and scholarly. Popular sources are those that are written primarily to entertain or to non-scholars. 95% of the articles that you read on your social media feed will call it, would qualify as popular. If you have favorite websites, like, I don't know, BuzzFeed or something like that that you follow, uh, then you're going to be dealing with popular sources. Because the purpose of a popular source is not to tell you the complete and total unbiased truth. It's to entertain you and keep you engaged. We have this really fun, uh, this really fun channel uh, in the United States, and I understand you can get it over here. I don't know if y'all have ever watched it. Uh, the History Channel. Have any of y'all ever heard of that? Uh, the History Channel sounds nice and scholarly, right? We're going to watch lots of documentaries about history. Well, the truth is it's notoriously bad about a lot of its history. Why? Because the History Channel is not there to teach you history. The History Channel is there to keep you interested in watching commercials. And so they're not going to put on things that are horribly unpopular. They're not going to put on really long things that are very detailed. They're going to put on fun things that keep you, uh, keep you occupied and interested. That's why about 90% of it is Nazis and UFOs. Uh, and and it, once, it, once it gets dark, they start talking about vampires. Uh, so, yeah. And hopefully you see the problem with that. And of course, 
for this particular paper, using po I'm not, I'm not going to be nailing you on this is a popular source, this is a scholarly source. If you want to use a popular source, it's okay. But as you move from this paper into 3BA, they're going to start pressing you more and more for scholarly, 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 scholarly. It's because scholarly, and for our purposes here, is better. Why? They're written by scholars to scholars. They have been reviewed before publication for errors uh, and bias and whatnot. And they are primarily concerned with trying to tell the complete truth from the author's perspective, and that, that is key too. Just because it's a scholarly book doesn't make it magic truth. A scholarly book can be just as wrong as a popular book, but at least you know it's been through a, a process that makes it respectable. So if you come to me with a scholarly book, and I look at this book and I'm like, I disagree with the author's thesis. I think he did this wrong, that, and the other. I at least respect the author's effort. And I think it's worth my time. If you come to me with a long Reddit thread by an anonymous author that has no sources whatsoever, and you hand that to me, I'm, I'm going to be like, why should I waste my time with this? I can't even tell that the person has actually put effort into this. All they've done is word vomit onto the screen. So what you're trying to do with the scholarly sources is you want to you emphasize those things that are in theory unbiased, in theory well-researched, and even if you disagree with them, they're worth your time and people who see them in your paper are going to think that you've put your, put your effort out. Anyway, very quickly, when I, a lot of people don't understand when you publish something that is scholarly, it doesn't just get published. Uh, for example, if you publish in a scholarly journal, uh, I've done this multiple times, you submit your paper to the journal's editor. First, the journal's editor, who's a specialist in that area, looks at it and goes, hmm, is this worth de dealing with? They, they may look at it and go, eh, nobody, people have said this a hundred times, or this has been disproved a hundred, no, rejected, boom, go find someplace else, we're not interested. Uh, but more likely, well, you hope, they're going to go, hmm, maybe. Then they take that, that article and they send it to a board of scholars that have agreed to serve with this journal. And these scholars are the leading scholars in their field, in theory, or at least way on up there. And they all read this article and they rip it to pieces. And then they write back and they say, either publish it, publish it with revisions, or don't publish it at all. And if, the, and if all the scholars say, this is, this is pointless, this is stupid, they won't publish it. Most likely, what you hope for, the best you can hope for is they'll write back and say, well, they did this good, but they need this here and they need that there. And they need to explore this source and respond to that theory. And then we'll publish it. And so it goes back to the author. The author makes all the changes. Then it comes back and it finally gets published. Uh, that process, and it's the same for books, that process is what makes scholarly sources worth your time and your research because it represents something much more than just somebody's vague opinion. So again, at the 3BA level and above, you want to use those scholarly sources. Here, I'm going to be more flexible. I want, I'm wanting you mainly to work on basic source choice, and I want to see how you're deploying those sources in the text. And that, of course, is key. I'm, I had that, I'm ha having that conversation with, with, with a, uh, an off site student right now, just listing your sources at the end of the paper is not doing your research well. You know, I can list, I, I, if you want, I can list a, give you a list of sources right now that I haven't read. If I don't see you actually using the sources in the paper and citing the sources, the sources are meaningless. So you have to actually use them properly. That, that's going to be the kind of thing that I'm really looking for. So still go ahead and try to start choosing these strong sources. So how do you identify respectable sources? <clears throat> there are a number of ways to do that. And I'll, again, note that I've already hit on this, but note that there is a difference between respectable and accurate. Just because something is scholarly does not mean it is true. It does not mean that you have to accept it. One thing that most students, I will say, and yes, I was one of them, they sort of come into the university with this bias that says, if it's in a book, it must be true. 
uh, and, and a lot of people have had, this, uh, have had this experience in the university where the professor says something and the professor says something that's different from what's in the textbook. And so somebody raises their hand and says, but I read in a book that it's this way. And the professor says, ah, yes, reading books is wonderful. I encourage you to do more of it. <coughs> and they, the professor goes right on about his, his or her business. Uh, and you, you seem shocked because I read it in a book. That means it must be true. You must accept it if it's in a book. Well, the truth is people write books. People like your professors. And so a book is hopefully a good thing. It's hopefully well-researched and well-reasoned, but a book is not automatically infallible, not anything that was written by a pure human being. Let's put it that way. And so just because something's in a book, it doesn't mean you have to accept it. Just because something is respectable, it doesn't mean you have to believe it. Uh, you can disagree, you can go back and forth, whatever. But you want to make sure that the sources that you have in your paper are things that are respectable. So the easy way to identify respectable sources is stick to the sources you can find on a college or university website. Now, I never did actually finish when I was talking about the transformation of the library. Libraries, because of the internet, are no longer about just keeping books in one place. Libraries are conduits for information. That's why, and I really need to go check the UIM page. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to do that. Uh, but that's why most libraries uh, grant you special access to all of these different databases and ebook repositories uh, and websites and projects and whatnot uh, that you would not otherwise have access to. It's because what they're doing is you know, they're not trying to store everything in their building, but they're trying to send you to the best information that you can find. So if you go to a library website or, or for a university and you find a, and, and you're able to find access to books and articles and sources, at the very least, you know a professionally trained paid librarian has vetted these sources for you to begin with and they've kept out a lot of the junk. So the very fact that it's there means you're probably pretty safe. And by the way, you don't have to just go to the UIM site. Uh, yes, most places, and I would presume UIM included, give you special privileges and special access if you're a student there. But the library sites, they usually have public, uh, uh, public holdings that they'll let anybody look at. So you can go to, to Purdue or Harvard uh, or... Yeah, I don't know, the University of Georgia, the University of Bonn, uh, uh, Oxford University, well, which would choose a college in the Oxford University, the, the Bodleian or something. Uh, so you, you have all of these places are going to have these pre-vetted sources uh, that you can just use. You don't even have, to, even have to deal with it. If you want to go farther than that, there are several questions that you should ask. So... You're, you're not going to just go to the website. You're not just going to go through the library. You're going to go out onto the general internet. Uh, questions that you can ask are first, who is the author and what are his or her qualifications? If the author is a scholar or a professional in the field that you're working in, you're probably in good shape. On the other hand, if the author is uh, John Doe, who's a banker running a website on... Uh, World War II history because he likes it. Probably not the best source for your university paper. I mean, I'm sure John Doe is a nice guy, and I hope John Doe says some good things about history, but in terms of you quoting from him and putting him in your paper, um, probably not a great idea. But then that's, that's another way to put it. <clears throat> this may sound kind of silly at first, but if you think about it, Getting to be quoted in your paper is a privilege. And if that sounds crazy, it's the truth. You're giving that person and that source your stamp of approval. You're saying, this is worth listening to. This is worth paying attention to. And I don't know about you, but I hope that your stamp of approval on something matters to you a little more than just throwing things together. So 
before you actually put somebody in your paper, make sure they're worthy of you. Make sure they're actually worthy of, your, uh, of you endorsing them. And then, of course, the farther you go in your career, the more, in, the more important that becomes. Even as a teacher, you're going to be standing up in front of your students endorsing these sources and these people. And you could, it, it, could, it, could, it could really come to matter. Anyway, so second, is it researched and documented with plenty of reliable sources? So if you pick up a book and it does not have a single footnote in the book, and there are no sources listed in the back of the book, probably not something you want to use. Now, you want to read it for the fun of it uh, on, a, on a Saturday night when you're being an introvert? Sure, that's fine. But putting it in your paper, probably not. You need to be able to see where they got their information. Uh, third, who is the publisher? That is something a lot of people don't think about, but it really can actually give you quite a bit of information and it can help you sometimes disqualify sources without even having to look any further. And that's a big deal too. You've got 10 books sitting in front of you that you need to go through. If you can look at one and within 30 seconds go, this is going to be no use to me and set it down, then you've just made big progress. So why spend an hour trying to figure out if this book is worthwhile when you can just go, huh, bam, done. Uh, one, some examples, and this, this, this is so, the, the publishers are so wide and varied that it's, I can't really give you too many specific examples. You'll get to know them as you start doing your research in different areas because there are different publishers that specialize in different areas. So having a book from the University of Nebraska Press that talks about the American Civil War is a good thing, but the University of Nebraska Press on... I don't know, fashion, maybe not. Uh, but as you start trying, as you start going, you'll, you'll get the idea. But yeah, as a quick example, there's an American press called Scholastic. And I actually have some people have told me they've heard of Scholastic, uh, even over here. Uh, Scholastic sounds like, wow, that's, that's a really scholarly press. Anybody know what Scholastic publishes? Children's books. In the United States, all the way up through early high school, scholastic books are everywhere. I'm reading scholastic books to my four-year-old right now. Biscuit, the puppy, does everything. Biscuit goes to the farm. Biscuit goes to church. Biscuit goes here. Biscuit goes there. Biscuit does this. Uh, and so if you, if you come across, a, and I'll, this is an example, if you come across uh, a, a bunch of search results, and you see a book listed from Scholastic Publishers, just keep scrolling. <laughs> you don't need to even deal with it. So you'll get that sense of which ones are appropriate and which ones aren't. Uh, and by the way, yes, I do see some people put books by Scholastic into their, uh, their bibliographies in some of the classes I've taught. Uh, because some of the, the I, guess they, I guess they either didn't read it or they weren't paying attention, but it would, it, the title would be something like George Washington, Scholastic. And what it is, is it's like a, very early high school or middle school book in their university paper. And then finally, who's the audience? If the audience is very clearly other scholars, you're probably in pretty good shape. If the audience looks like it's, uh, you know, I don't know, people who are just pa have a passing interest in it, probably not. And no, uh, no, you're not going to find, many times you won't find sources that will check all of these boxes but use these as indicators to try to figure out, is this something that I can actually use? Gutting a book, I'm just gonna to try to go through this really fast because I said it's a secret weapon up there, it really is. I didn't learn about this until I got into graduate school. If you learn it now and you actually practice it, you can read entire books in an hour. When I say books, I mean like a 700 page book. You can walk away from that 700 page book understanding what that book is about, what the argument is, and whether you think that author has succeeded or not in an hour. So how the heck do you do that? Well, it gets down to all of this organization that we've been beating into your heads. 
We keep talking about how you organize your essay, how you organize your essay. You've got your introduction that culminates in your thesis statement. Your thesis statement tells you everything that you're going to argue in the paper. Then you have your body paragraphs, point one, two, and three, and they point back to the thesis. And the uh, body paragraphs each have a topic sentence. And the topic sentence uh, summarizes everything that's in the paragraph. And then you've got the conclusion. Well, if you stop and think about that, what that means is if you've written a good paper, I can read your entire paper in five minutes and know exactly what you mean. How do I, why, why do I say that? Because I don't have to read every flipping word. I read the thesis statement. I read the topic sentences and I glance through the conclusion. And from that, I should be able to tell the guts of everything that you're saying in that, in that uh, paper. A well-written book is exactly the same thing. They're going, to, they're going to have a thesis statement in something like an introduction chapter. Each chapter is like its own mini essay. It's going to have a thesis statement that supports the main thesis statement of the book. And then every topic sentence of every paragraph under that, uh, under that introduction is going to support the thesis of that chapter. And then the conclusion is going to go back and, re and reiterate everything and draw it all together. So if you understand where this is, assuming the book is poorly written books, you can't do anything with. But if it's a well-written book, you can take that book and instead of having to read every word, you can mine it for information. You know where to look for what you need. You go get what you need and you're done. So that means that... It's possible to read these books in very short order. And I've actually published book reviews that I'm not ashamed of that I read an entire book that thick in like two hours, wrote the book review. It was a good book review and got it published. And why do I say I'm not ashamed of it? Because I know that using this method, I know what that book said. Clearly, I can, under, I can understand it, articulate it, and argue it. And this is so important because by the time you get farther on, if you go farther beyond, if you don't just uh, end with 3BA, you're going to get to the point where you literally cannot read all the books that they're asking you to read in your classes. Uh, when I was uh, working on my, on my PhD, I would have a class, just one class, and for that class, we'd have to read, we'd have to read in class 16 books. We'd have to read two to three articles a week. And then on top of that, we'd have a paper requiring another 40 or 50 books. That's for one class. You can't do it unless you understand this. Because then you go through and you're able to get what you need and move on. So the real trick, other than what I just told you, is being, being able to prioritize books. There are books of a lifetime, books, one week books, one day books, one hour books, and 10 minute books. And they're all gonna change based on what you're doing. So for example, uh, well, a one week book, this is a book that's very important. You need to read the whole thing. Sit down, start with the introduction, go straight through, be done with it. This is something, this is like a, a major book written by one of, the, one of the leading scholars in your field that you're talking about. A one day book, read the introduction and conclusion. Read the beginning and ending of each chapter and scan the pages for topic sentences. You can get through to really long books in short order if you stay focused and do that. How about a one hour book? Read the introduction and conclusion uh, for a fast grip on the author's thesis. Find that thesis statement, you can say what this book is about. One, uh, a 10 minute book, Scan the intro for the author's thesis. Find out what this book is about, what they're going to argue. If you want to be a little extra thorough, go to their conclusion and they'll talk about how they think they've succeeded or failed. And that will help you there. And of course, if we're talking about a lifetime book, these are, there are relatively few of those out there, but devour it. Go, go back and read it again every two or three years. Uh, most people who read have books like that. They're not necessarily scholarly. For me, uh, The Lord of the Rings is like that. And I go back every, two, every few years and I read that. I know people who read Harry Potter like that. Um, we, we do that with the Chronicles of Narnia with my, uh, with my, my children. 
the one thing I will say with all of these is take notes. The one problem that you have with this approach is if you're not taking your time and reading carefully, it's difficult for the information to leave your short-term memory and go into your long-term memory because you're not repeating it again and again. So if you're gonna do a one hour book, take notes on what you're finding. That way you can go back and you can refresh yourself later because if you don't, I can almost guarantee you, you will forget. So searching tips. Our, well, first I said, do not go to, uh, I think I said this, do not go to Google for, for your scholarly research, for your research paper. Do not go to Google for the reasons that we stated. Uh, the absolute last thing you want to do is a general Google search because it brings up all kinds of different mess. So what I'm gonna talk about here is tips and tricks and places that you can go that are just as fast as Google, but that will bring you better results. <clears throat> so the goal here, as we said before, is to pare down the results. The problem with a Google search is that if you're just doing straight Google, it's gonna bring you a billion results you're never gonna be able to look at all of those and the results that you get on the first few pages are gonna all be somebody's paid advertisements. So what you have to do is figure out how can I search in such a way that I just cut all that garbage out from the very beginning. So one search and instead of a billion results, you get 150 maybe or a thousand. If you're being, if, if, if you're doing your 3BA thesis and this is a, you're, you need to be thorough, you could make it through a thousand, uh, through a thousand hits, looking at each hit, trying to decide if this is something that you think is worth your while. So you got to figure out how to bring back only the things that matter to you. So here's the first trick. Use reliable search engines geared towards serious research. They are out there. People just don't know what they are. Have any of you ever heard of Google Scholar? For example, oh, I saw, saw someone nodding their head, congratulations. Yeah, you're one of the few. Uh, Google Scholar uh, is probably, because everybody just loves Google. At the university I last taught at, I was called the Google guy because I did everything with my Google suite. Uh, so if you're gonna do Google, Instead of just going to google.com, go to scholar.google.com. Google Scholar is a search engine that brings back only academic results. Excuse me. And so it by itself, it doesn't bring you back paid ads. It brings back the best scholarly results that it can find. And so already there from the beginning, you're gonna be making better, or you're gonna make out better. It will also bring back hits from university libraries. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that Google has been in the process for years of digitizing entire university libraries. And when I say digitizing entire universe, university libraries, I mean literally they are sitting down and scanning in the pages of books and you can actually search them through Google Scholar. Uh, also books.google.com. And when you go to look at one of these books, you don't quote it like it's a website. It's not a website. It's an actual published scholarly book. You're just looking at it through the internet. So first Google Scholar, then uh, say Google Books, you can have all kinds of access to all kinds of things. There's some books that are still under copyright. They'll give you samples of those books. And sometimes the sample is all you need. If all you need is a few statements about a certain topic and you can see that in the uh, sample, hey, you're in good shape. And if not, you're able to go back and actually sometimes purchase the book or, or rent the book or borrow the book straight from Google Scholar or you can get it, you know how to get it th through the library. <clears throat> Academic.microsoft.com, that is Microsoft's version of Google Scholar. It's gonna do the same thing for you. It's gonna bring back only those academic search results. Worldwide science obviously is focused more on scientific research, uh, but it's the same principle. Uh, RefSeq is another example of these. So I think we've finally gotten to the point, thankfully, that 
professors are not telling you, don't search on the internet. It's out of curiosity. Have y'all ever had a, pro a professor or teacher tell you, never research on the internet? Anybody? Good. For years, that's been the thing that I've had to face is just telling people, it's okay to search on the internet. You have to search right. Go on Google, uh, just a straight Google search. No, do not do that. Go to Wikipedia. No. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and I'll say it again. Do not put Wikipedia in your research papers. Anybody know why? What's wrong with Wikipedia? Everybody can change it and sometimes no one can. Uh, first, everybody can change it. So if you've got a hot topic, go, go look up the Wikipedia page for uh, a controversial politician, for example, and then look at the edit history. There, there are wars, go, edit wars going on on those pages where people who hate that politician go in there and put embarrassing information or value judgments against them or sometimes outright lies they'll put on the page and then the politician supporters who love the politician, they're going on there and they're re-editing it out and they're changing it to say this politician is such a wonderful person. And those changes can happen sometimes in a matter of minutes. It's entirely possible for you to go to that Wikipedia page, quote from that Wikipedia page, turn in your paper and the next day I go and check that Wikipedia page and it doesn't say what you tell me it said. Another big problem that you have, and this is why I say nobody can, corporations and political movements have figured out how important Wikipedia is because when you just Google search something, what's the first thing that pops up? Wikipedia. And so everybody just clicks on Wikipedia. Wow, this is great stuff. And look at all of the footnotes, some of which are made up. Um, so they know that Wikipedia is, that is, is extremely important to, to maintaining people's opinion. So they actually establish Wikipedia teams whose job it is to do nothing other than monitor pages that are connected to that company or that po uh, political movement and make sure that only what they want shows up. And the, literally, there are people who they do nothing all day but sit there and look at the Wikipedia page and if something changes on there and they don't like it, they switch it back immediately. And it doesn't matter how passionate you are about this subject, if they're paid 24 seven to do this, you're not gonna be able to outlast them. So people will go in and they'll make a change. This is, this is an example might be <clears throat> a pharmaceutical company uh, has, a, there's a page about a, um, a drug that they have on the market. Uh, there's a, a, a study that comes out that says this drug could potentially be causing harm. So somebody goes on to the Wikipedia page and writes a fair and balanced uh, paragraph about the controversy over this drug. And within five minutes, it's gone. And all it's talking about is how wonderful this drug is. <coughs> so that is why I say do not use Wikipedia. Uh, I'm not against online encyclopedias. Online encyclopedias are a wonderful place to start your research. But if you want to use one, bookmark the Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that. Use an actual encyclopedia that has a board of editors and professionals who write these articles and, and are actually held to a particular standard. Yeah, am I saying Wikipedia is completely useless? No, I, uh, for things that don't matter, yeah, sure, why not? If it's something that uh, actually does matter, then no, do not trust Wikipedia. The, uh, the, the system itself is broken. And especially since liter usually, literally, when you Google something, you've got Wikipedia here, and like th two or three links down is the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's on the same flipping screen. All you have to do is drag your mouse like this much farther down the screen to get to the Encyclopedia Britannica. So don't go to Wikipedia for these, uh, these sources uh, that you're, for this, this assignment. And I'll, go, I'll, I'll just say it. 
I will ding you for Wikipedia in this paper. Do you can do better. It's not difficult. So yes. And again, do not result uh, resort to a general Google search unless you have a very good, very specific reason to do so. If you're using these, you're going to find more than enough sources, scholarly sources about just about any topic you can imagine. <clears throat> so there's no reason to do a general Google search. What are, what are some, some examples of when you might consider it? Well, if you're working on something that has to do with popular culture, so you're doing that Witcher paper and you've searched these and you're not seeing some of the, some of the more popular bloggish type stuff that you'd like to talk about in this particular paper. So then you might want to do a Google search, but don't do it unless you have a really good uh, reason. And what I would do if I were you is just go on your computer, make a bookmark folder for those web searches and the Encyclopedia Britannica. And then when you go to do your research, just go to your bookmark folder, go through one after another, see what sources you get. It really should take no time at all. And some searching tips. Uh, we could go on about this for a very long time, but again, the goal is to cut out the extra pointless hits that you're getting back. Searching the internet is a lot like fishing. And I'm presuming fishing here in Poland is like fishing in the US. You stand there on the bank or in your boat and you throw the line out and you bring it back in. And you throw the line out and you bring it back in. And every time you throw the line out, you're gonna put it in a little different place, you're gonna throw it a little differently and you're liable to get a different result. So you're gonna to have to make multiple searches, but we wanna keep them to the minimum and we wanna get only the things that you care about. We want to catch fish, not plants, for example. So first off, make your searches more complex. Uh, use phrases of five to eight words. If you're going to talk about The Witcher, don't just go to Google and type in Witcher. Uh, type in Witcher books and then give the author's name or Witcher reviews or Witcher Netflix series, those types of things will cut out a lot of the extra garbage that you're, that, you're, that you're trying to avoid. Use nouns and adjectives, leave off articles, which is something Polish people like. Uh, tag essential terms with a plus uh, and terms you want to exclude with a minus. Most places do that, or most uh, search engines let you do that. And again, you'd be surprised, a lot of people don't know that. So if you realize that you want a specific thing, and it, it's only this one specific aspect, put the plus next to it. So you go into a search for cloud formation. Uh, you're gonna get tons of different sources about all kinds of different clouds and different situations. And you don't care about those. You let's say you only care about the cumulonimbus clouds for your report you're writing. Well, putting plus cumulonimbus basically means that, that Google is not going to bring you, or these search engines are not going to bring you back any page that does not have the word cumulonimbus on it. And if the word cumulonimbus is on it, it's probably worth your time. And so all the others get left off. Another good example is Sherman. Let's say you decide you want to, uh, wanted to write your uh, paper about the American Civil War. And you say, hey, this guy, William T. Sherman, he looks like an interesting guy. He was a northern general, uh, pretty famous. So you go and you search Sherman and it brings back a bunch of articles about the Sherman tank from World War II, which was named after William T. Sherman. So doing a search that says Sherman minus tank would be a great way to get only sources back that deal probably with this guy and you exclude all of this stuff, all of the extra stuff. Uh, place specific phrases that must appear exactly as you, uh, exactly as you type them in quotation marks. So if you just type in William T. Sherman, U S civil war general with no quotation marks, then it's going to search for pages that have William 
and pages that have Sherman and pages that have U.S. and pages that have Civil War. And that's how you end up with a billion hits because any page that it finds on the internet with any one of these uh, search terms is going to show up. But if you put in quotation marks, William T. Sherman, then what you're going to do is you're going to get just those pages that have that exact phrase on them. And that'll cut out a lot of the extra stuff. Now, uh, what, are, what do you think might be some of the limitations of this? What's the, what's the problem of using quotes like that? And it's, it's easily dealt with, but what's the problem? If you misquote even slightly, it's not going to show up. Another problem is there are a lot of times different ways of classifying and spelling things. So here we said William T. Sherman, but what if the page says William Sherman? What if the page says William Tecumseh Sherman? That's what the T stands for. What if the page says Sherman, comma, William T? Uh, it's, going to leave, it, it's going to leave all of those out too. So this is where those multiple searches come in. Do a search for William T. Sherman in quotes. See what you find there. Then do a search for Sherman William T. Then do a search for Sherman uh, or Tecumseh Sherman. Try the different combinations. And each time what you get back will hopefully be a focused amount that you can deal with. <clears throat> And the more you can ratchet up the complexity of your searches, the more you can cut down on all that extra junk. And the more you cut down on that extra junk, the faster you're going to find the sources that you need. And you're going to find hopefully the best sources, not just whatever happened to come up on top.